Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Joyce Martin, and on behalf of the Labriola National American Indian Data Center, I would like to welcome you to the Labriola Center and say how happy I am to have Dr. Kathleen Cahill, Assistant Professor of History at University of New Mexico, here to speak with us today. Um, before we begin the program, I'd like to thank a few people without whom this event would not be possible. First, I'd like to thank Dr. Donald Vixco, um, who first proposed the idea of the Labriola Center American Indian National Book Award, and the judging committee for the book award, Professor of History Donald Fixico, and fellow judges, American Indian Studies Professor David Martinez, and Professor of History Catherine Osborne. And I'd also like to thank Emeritus Professor of History and uh, Book Award Judge and Strong Book Award Supporter Peter Iverson as well. I want to thank the students who work in the Labriola Center, it's Jessica Antonio, Tamara Lee, Tiani Dale, and Arlene Serrano, and a special thanks to the Mail Services staff for their um, help in setting up the room today. And I would also like to thank ASU Libraries Business Operations Manager Lily Johnson for all of her hard work um, pulling all of the uh, work together for the book award and also for uh, University Librarian Sherry Schmidt for her continuous support. Um, if you hadn't already noticed, we do have refreshments in the classroom right to my left. So please help yourself to refreshments um, once the program is completed. So at this time, uh, I'd like to present Dr. Cahill with the Labriola Center American Indian National Book Award for her book, Federal Fathers and Mothers, A Social History of the United States Indian Service, 1869 to 1933. Dr. Cahill, congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, and at this time, I'm going to turn the floor over to Dr. Cahill and Dr. Martinez for a discussion of Dr. Catherine Cahill's award-winning book, and they're going to be um, uh, sitting right here. Okay. Well, as is customary at this event, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Cahill a few questions, after which uh, I'm going to open the floor up to Q&A from the audience, and mm -hmm. we're going to have a very nice time getting to know uh, Kathleen and her wonderful work of scholarship here. So I want to begin by asking you, you know, what was the, the inspiration for this book? In particular, how did you develop this interest in the Indian Bureau? Mm -hmm. And especially, how did you develop this particular interest in white female employees of the Indian Bureau? <laughs> well, it was all actually pretty serendipitous. Um, I'm from Northern California. And when I graduated from college, my aunt and uncle gave me a book of local history from Northern California, a couple books. And one of them was this memoir of two women um, who had worked for the Indian Service in 1909. And they were these sort of ladies um, mm -hmm. from New York who um, sort of considered this all a big adventure, but the Indian office had sent them out into the mountains of Northern California, which for them was out in the middle of nowhere, right? Um, and uh, again, I sort of was struck by the fact that this was 1909, and I didn't think that the federal government was employing women to begin with, and that they would sort of be sending them out, um, again, sort of in these, these places that were up um, in native communities pretty far from any white settlements. And so they wrote this memoir about their experience, and, it, and their voice also was really just a very compelling, it's a good story. Um, but it made me really sort of ask what's going on here. This seems mm -hmm. unusual. And um, so I started following that. And they were working in this position called field matrons, which Dr. Osborne knows about. Um, and their, their job was to go into these communities and go to Native women's homes and teach them how to be civilized, quote unquote. So cook and clean and raise children in these sort of appropriate ways. And I started following that and wrote about that program for my master's thesis. Um, and so it was sort of this who are these white women and what are they doing and this sort of thing. But what I realized when I was doing that research was that no one had really written on the employees of the Indian Service, um, but there was actually a lot of information on them in the sources I was coming across for all of these positions. 
And um, what struck me was, again, just very surprising the number of, of women, white women, but also that so many Native people were employed, and men and women. Um, and so when it came time to choose a dissertation topic, it sort of seemed like it was right there. And so I, I went, went for that. Let me ask you um, a somewhat practical question then. As you proceeded to do this research, yeah. um, what kind of uh, material did you uncover? Where did you go? Mm. And equally important, you know, how did uh, you create this 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 narrative? I, I, I'm asking because I think it'll be interesting for the students in particular to know how does one take all this archival material and evoke this whole era, you know, mm. this whole time and place. <laughs> It took a long time. Um, so I started this project in 1996, and it became a book in 2011. Um, so it didn't it didn't come out like this initially. Um, my dissertation is a very different piece of work. So I, I would I would say to you, writing dissertations like it will happen. It will just take a lot of work. Um, but. The initial sources that I looked at were the, the annual reports, the, the published reports from the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, and um, what they had in them that was really stunning to me that no one had used before, really, um, were these lists of the employees. So it had the name of the employee, it had their position for many years. Um, for the women, it, had, um, it indicated miss or missus, so you knew if they were married or single. Um, race, um, how much they were paid, where they were born, so just sort of an enormous amount of individual information, sort of social history, um, that, that people who had written about the Indian Bureau had overlooked. Um, there was one book that talked about the kinds of positions and how that had changed over time, but he hadn't mentioned that, that many of those positions were filled, again, by women, white women or Native people. Um, so I started just with that and, and actually really used that in addition to memoirs. Um, in particular for the dissertation. And then again, sort of another serendipitous moment. It's a really good idea to, to get your work out there at conference papers or workshops because I um, was giving a paper at a workshop and someone who's not in my field, um, who did immigration history and sort of Asian American history said, you know, the federal government kept personnel files um, after a certain point, and you're, some of these people you're interested in might have files. You should look at that. Um, and she was right, and it, I mean, it just transformed the whole thing. Um, so that I didn't really, wasn't able to incorporate much of them into the dissertation, so the book really drew um, heavily on those. But these files, which are not kept in a national archive, um, if you're working on federal employees in any way, um, they're kept in St. Louis. And you have to have the name because I thought, well, I'll just take a sample of the Indian service and get some of these files. And I tried to do that. And they said, well, they're all alphabetized. And they're in order, you know, there are chunks from 1905 to 1939. Every employee in the federal government, civil service, um, is in alphabetical order. So you can't really do a, a sample. So you, I had to, to find the names. Um, but luckily, I had these annual reports with the names. So there was a year that I could match them up. Um, and so I, I took an initial sample that really mostly ended up being white employees. They just didn't find the files for Native employees. So I gave them the name of every Native woman that I had on this list, which and it was a about 200 and something, and they found 65 files for <laughs> Native women, Native employees. Um, and they just are incredible. I mean, these files are amazing because they were learning, the federal government's learning to bureaucratize at this point, so a lot of what's in those files I don't think would be in fe personnel files today. It's a lot of personal information. Um, in the early files, they really don't even have the forms. They become much more sort of administratively sophisticated later. But so there are letters from these women um, writing to the Commissioner of Indian Affairs talking about what they want, why they want the jobs, if they're having trouble with their supervisors, um, if they want to be transferred. Um, their evaluation reports, books that they're reading, they would ask them to list the, the books. I mean, just all sorts of um, information about them that was really wonderful to have. Uh, so they're really incredibly rich source. Yeah, and speaking of the richness of, of your discourse, one of the things I really enjoyed about your book, found fascinating, mm 
is the way in which you humanize you know, the employees of the Indian Bureau, especially uh, the, the female employees. Mm -hmm. And so I want to ask you if it's, if it's not uh, too quirky a question, <laughs> what was it about the Indian Bureau mm -hmm. that attracted as many female white employees as it did? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I mean, one of the things I found really interesting mm -hmm. was that not all of them, but there was sort of a pattern of some of these women. I mean, they, they request jobs for all sorts of reasons, right? Economic reasons, they want to move west, um, their husbands are in the Indian service. But for a certain number of them, it's this adventure, mm -hmm. right? Um, and they, many of them wanted to join sort of the foreign mission service, and they equate it with mission, missionary work in a lot of ways, but their parents wouldn't let them go to China or let them go to India. And so sort of the home missions or the Indian service became kind of a way of being, having this adventure, but their parents approved or it wasn't too far from home. So that's certainly a thread in there as well. But it's, it really ran the gamut of reasons for why they, they chose. And I was certainly interested in those people who had sort of those stories that were, were more interesting. But it, again, lots of reasons. And sometimes many of those same reasons in one person, right? I wanted a job, but I also wanted an, an adventure, and I wanted to be somewhere where it was warm. That's a, a refrain that comes up a lot. <laughs> so as you were uncovering the, these personal narratives of joining the Indian Bureau, going out to the reservation, working with the community, was there any um, one person's story that mm. uh, struck a deep chord in you? Well, or as I said, I sort of started, I mean, the whole reason that the two women who write their memoir really that's the reason I started following these stories. And then, I mean, there were so many stories um, of people, and I couldn't follow them all to the end. And there are a lot of people I'm still sort of interested in. But um, I think the stories that the chapter where I talk about the um, intermarriages between white women and Native men, um, because the, the Indian Service is this really many young single employees, um, it's, it's heterosocial, right, men and women and they're often in these isolated positions and that's who they, that's their entertainment, but their work, they're sort of with these people all the time and so there's some romance that happens. Um, and, you know, sort of lots of marriages, everybody's getting married. And, um, but in these cases, and I had sort of six cases of um, Native men and white women who fell in love and get married and um, I had sort of a, a certain amount of information on them, um, I really, was caught up in their stories because it, many of them, or all but one of them really, sort of faced incredible backlash from their decision. Not, and it, it's interesting because this is the same time in the South where you know interracial relationships are incredibly taboo and, and lynchings are the result, often the result of even a rumor about this. And that's not necessarily the case between um, native and white relationships, but they do, there are moments where they sort of run up against, um, again, sort of a backlash. And the first couple, um, his name is Samuel Campbell, and he's um, Eastern Band Cherokee and uh, Cora Bell Fellows. And they're really the first relationship that I can see between a white woman and a Native man, and it's in 1882, I think. And their story is splashed all over the national newspapers, right? And everyone's sort of shocked, shocked that this has happened, and oh, we told you if you hired white women, this is what would happen, and it sort of becomes this, um, again, sort of moment in which there's a national dialogue about it, but there are also these real people, and she's mortified, and you know, they're <coughs> frustrated by what's happening, so I got, you know, there's some of these stories that I became very um, invested in finding out what happened and sort of thinking about these people and, and what they were going through um, in that. Well, you also talk a little about uh, Native employees of the Indian Bureau as well. Mm -hmm. uh, how did their motivations for mm -hmm. joining the Indian Bureau overlap or differ mm -hmm. from their white counterparts? Well, certainly they also had a whole variety of motives when you, it, and this is where my source base is what they were writing in to the commissioner. So there were a lot of reasons that they gave for wanting jobs um, that may or may not have been the only reasons. But again, like the, the white employees, it sort of ran the gamut between, right, I, I want a job, it pays fairly well, um, I don't want to be away from home anymore, I want to come back and have a job. Um, at home, I want to be near my children. 
Um, but what I talk about in the book is that um, for white employees, this isn't really political in a very active sense. I mean, it's they're participating in a political project, but they are not thinking of it that way. But that for the Native employees, it is. And there are two ways in which um, I think they're very deliberately undermining um, federal policy by taking these positions. And the first is by using it to stay in place. Um, so people who try to stay at home, right, in their own communities, and this is one of the very few um, positions in which you can earn a wage in most reservation communities. And so using it to uh, make a living and stay um, with their tribes and with their communities. And I talk about, um, Jackie Rand talks about sort of participating in everyday um, community activities as being really important for sort of cultural identity and, and main maintenance of that identity. And this is one way that many of those people can do that. And the Indian office recognizes recognizes this fairly quickly and begins to say, you can't employ people of their own tribes. They, they try to say this. They can't. They're, they really rely on native labor because it's cheaper um, and they, they need a lot. Um, but they do put into place this idea of you shouldn't be employing people in their own communities. And so you see people, particularly in sort of um, the, the higher positions, like teacher or clerk or some of these positions where they had a little more authority than the manual labor positions, they try to transfer those people away um, from their communities. Um, and there's this constant rhetoric of their political troublemakers. This is one of the patterns I found in those files where the first time I saw something about an employee being a troublemaker, I thought, oh, maybe they are, right? There's a lot of that in the Indian service. Um, but when you see it over and over again about Indian employees on their own reservations being called political troublemakers, especially if they spoke the language and this effort to transfer them away, it became clear that that was something that was one of the tensions in the Indian office's hiring sort of patterns is they wanted to hire Native people because they were cheaper, but then they realized that Native people were using those positions to help their communities um, or to, again to stay. And then particularly with Native women, this idea of trying to stay with their children. So even if it couldn't be in their communities, it would, they would request positions to work in the schools where their children are, can be enrolled or are enrolled. Um, and so, although there's a Native father that I actually talk about as well. But this, again, trying to undermine the federal government's efforts at, <coughs> well, I need to step back. The big point of federal um, policy, particularly with the boarding schools, was to, to break these family ties, which I'm sure many of you know. And so this idea of removing the children and breaking up the families was really um, sort of the first step. And then replacing the families with federal fathers and mothers was sort of the next step. And um, by being in the Indian service and working as one of those federal fathers and mothers, um, they, could, they could really uh, try to disrupt some of that that violence against families. So that's those are the two reasons that I really stress in the book. Okay, speaking of, uh, since you alluded to your subtitle, mm -hmm. can I get you to elaborate on that theme a little? Yeah. What, what do you mean by federal fathers and mothers? Um, well, the federal government was very, I mean, they're using that language. So I sort of borrowed that or used that um, as my framework in that when they're talking about setting up this administration that's very different from really anything the federal government had done before, they're sort of drawing on some of the, the work of Reconstruction um, and the Freedmen's Bureau as a model, but it, that was a very small program and um, was different in some ways. So in this sort of post-Civil War period, they, they're experimenting and they experiment with Indians because they're wards of the state and they sort of can in these particular ways. And um, again, they're, they're concerned with this Indian problem. And the Indian problem is that reservations have a lot of poverty um, and that reservations exist and are sort of maintaining tribal identity and they want to get rid of that. And the solution they hit on is this idea of using the family and, and here I use Ann Stoller's idea of intimate colonialism. Um, and the government decides to, as I said, sort of replace Native families and Native parents with sort of these federal employees. And initially, they, they're meant to be white employees. Um, so particularly in the schools, the hiring pattern is very much, 
based on this family model. So the superintendent of the school is often sort of talked about as the father, and the matron is constantly referred to as the school mother, and she would have been in charge of sort of the dorms and making sure the kids got up and got into the classroom. And so all of these positions, um, again, are sort of modeled on this idea that, that the employees will not just be doing their jobs, but they're also supposed to really kind of have these emotional relationships with, with the children. Um, and they talk about needing to, like, you have to love your, the kids you're working with. And it's all of this, again, breaking the, the intimate relationship between parents and children and trying to replace it. Um, with this other sort of surrogate um, families. And then this, the, the theory was that that could all happen in one generation and these children would grow up and the Indian problem would be solved because they would, they would have learned what they needed. What, the quotes that, that you see over and over is they would learn what they would have learned in white homes, right? And then they would become sort of individualized citizens and go on their way. And then this whole structure could be dismantled. The Indian Bureau would be temporary. The federal government would no longer have to pay for any, um, you know, any treaty obligations or any uh, reservation upkeep. And that would be, right, it would be gone. Um, so that that's this model of sort of intimate colonialism and using these effective relationships between people was really th what they saw as key to solving the Indian problem. With, with that in mind, I'm going to ask you to, to abstract a little from your, your narrative. For anyone working in the progressive era, mm -hmm. I've done that work too. Right, right. You know, the, the term concept assimilation mm -hmm. comes up regularly and it's in all of the scholarly okay. literature. <laughs> and we use that term assimilation, you know, enough where we use it like uh, there's a simple definition mm -hmm. behind that word. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, it's always been my sense that it's a much more complicated term than meets the eye. So my question is, <laughs> how do you understand the concept mm -hmm. of assimilation? Also, with regards to your subject, uh, what were the signs for the Indian Bureau that progress was being made mm. towards this objective. Okay. Well, I always go back to sort of what you know what my sources are saying, and um, when the administrators talked about assimilation, um, it was very much sort of an all or nothing. Um, it was sort of, and they used the home and the family again as really the key indicator. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll come back to sort of how you know, but that, um, you know, it was every, it was every little thing and little behavior. And I, I open, I think it's chapter two with this list of questions that are being put to um, Agent Riggs from one of the Dakota reservations. And they're, they're just throwing these details at him, like, what kind of silverware do they, do they use silverware? You know, do they live in houses? Um, do they use tablecloths? Do the men, you know, take care of their families and support their families? Um, what happens when someone dies? What happens to the property? And, and uh, there are these sort of little questions, I mean, again, down to sort of silverware, that on one hand seems really bizarre, and then on the other hand was for them, like, clearly very important, that it wasn't just um, sort of big sweeping behaviors. It was sort of every day, every little way of behaving, um, was important and that, that the way they wanted them to behave was as sort of middle class white um, farmers ideally but you know they would they would take non-farmers but sort of middle class values and behaviors of white America and 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 again the way they were measuring this was by these details of the household right were they behaving according to white gender norms and again, they spend a lot of time thinking about what women do in the home, which is um, to raise the children, to decorate the home, sort of in these particularly middle class ways. And they spend a lot of time on that. And that's what the field matrons are supposed to be doing. Um, you know, are they hanging curtains? Do they have pictures on the walls? Do they have rugs? Um, are they making bread, white bread? Um, and then men are supposed to be producing and supporting their families. Mm -hmm. And um, so the women are the really consumers and, and men are producers. And again, ideally as farmers. Um, so that, that these behaviors and gender norms are really the key to that. And then they would look at that right? and they would see, they, they could tell very easily how much further you have to go mm -hmm. to get to that point. And there's a moment in, I think it's 1920, 
Um, and right, the Indian Bureau hasn't disappeared, and they've been doing this now for a couple generations, and it was supposed to have disappeared, so they're kind of consternated. And um, I can't remember which commissioner it is, but he, he puts in place this um, study, and he, it's this industrial study, and it's, it's a phenomenal source. Um, they go every reservation to every allotment, um, and on a single piece of paper, they take a picture of the home, which is at the top of the paper, and then they write down who lives there, what they do, how many children they have, sort of what they own, what's in their houses, and again, there's a picture of the house, and um, you know, they blood quantum and whether or not they're competent or a ward, and that was a, a legal status. And so they try to do this for every single Native person on a reservation. And then the plan is that the superintendent of the reservation will come up with a five-year program that will get each one of these families to this assimilated point, right? And again, then it'll be done. Um, and for some of the reservations, actually do another study in 1925 um, so that there are two for each family. Um, so again, these sort of, I have a picture of one in the last chapter, I think. But by the 20s, things are beginning to change in terms of policy and ideas about the uh, Assimilate the possibility of assimilation, right? And you get hardening ideas about race, and that this idea of full and complete assimilation, white policymakers begin to think that that's not going to happen, and that it, and that Indians will be, will always be sort of a, a second class citizenry that will be a laboring class. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so that's a really long answer to your question. And no, I, have I gotten to to what you were? Have I answered it? <laughs> you did indeed, okay. and so I want to ask a complimentary question now. Uh, often the way in which uh, the story of uh, Indian white relations is told, you know, during this time period mm -hmm. is that you have Indians and the Indian rights organizations mm -hmm. on the one hand, and they represent the forces of good, right? And then on the other hand, you have the Indian Bureau, and it represents the forces of evil. Mm -hmm. And that narrative is very easy to mm -hmm. understand. I'm wondering, given the kind of relations that you're describing, you know, on, at, on the ground level, were there any instances of you know, white Indian Bureau employees joining the Indian cause? Mm. You know, was any subversiveness in, in the Indian Bureau? <laughs> I yes, and I I am an optimist, um, and I like happy stories. So I think I could have written this book differently, but I did emphasize these moments where people come together, right? I do talk, again, I focus on, I talk about the intermarriages, um, I talk about sort of sociability in the Indian service and, and places where people form friendships. Um, but there's a lot of places where that also doesn't happen, right? And there's a lot of um, places where you see both structural forms of racism and structural sort of forms of subordination, um, but also individuals who were, you know, worked in the service. There's a, an example I use where this, this guy, Earl Place, um, is reprimanded because he's clearly, he's, I think he's, it's, it's a woman named Lucy Jobin who's Ojibwe and French, she's mixed, and she writes in to complain about him and he's, he's called her a squaw. Right, and the Indian office says, well, you shouldn't do that. And he writes back and says, well, it wasn't meant for her, it was for sort of women collectively, which is worse, right, in many ways, right? And so, and he keeps his job, and they tell him, they're like, you're supposed to be setting an example, so stop saying things like that, rather than, you know, firing him. Um, but, so, you know, there was this sort of individual racism that people ran up against and structural problems. Um, but I do talk a lot about places where some of that was also overcome or, again, where people sort of formed friendships and sometimes alliances, but the place I really saw it was in terms of the development of intertribal um, cooperation or intertribal um, relationships. So people who were working for the Bureau, and again, they were trying to transfer people away from their home communities, so you end up getting a lot of employees working across Indian country um, and forming really close relationships between people of, with other tribes um, and defending native, you'd see tribes defending native employees um, because they realized what they were often being criticized for was protecting native interests, right, even though they were of different tribes. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do talk quite a bit about that and then 
the way in which I think the SAI, the Society of American Indians, um, is influenced by that, that many of them were employees, I um, mean, some continued to be, and, and saw that as something they had in common. Well, before I turn things over to the audience, I have uh, one more question. Uh, it, it's <coughs> clear that you succeeded in telling a part of the Indian Bureau story that really hasn't been told before, you know, with this emphasis on the employees. I, I want to ask, though, with regards to, um, you know, your, your reading public, mm. um, what do you want them to take away from reading your books, like what 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 lessons, what insights would you like them to? It's a difficult That's question, a tough question, I know. Question, actually, but, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, I think sort of what you alluded to in the last question. There's this sort of narrative out there about um, there are a couple narratives. Um, one is sort of the Indian service was bad, and sort of these these other groups, sort of these political groups, were good. But there's a lot of overlap, right? And I think that's important to, to understand. Um, and, I, and I don't think the Indian service was necessarily good. I think a lot of people, though, were able to or tried to really use it in their own ways. And some of them were successful um, and some of them were not. But that it, it is this, this very strange bureaucracy um, that, and, and for me as a social historian, sort of these experiences of people um, on the ground, as you said, are really important, right? And so it's not enough to sort of think about the Indian Bureau as sort of the theories of assimilation and what the administrators wanted and, um, you know, some of the, the really awful policies that did get put into place, but understanding um, how people you know, who was running it, right? Because it, it comes down to sort of individuals, so who was putting these policies into place and how did they interact with those policies and what effect did they have on them? Um, and again, it's particularly for the Native employees, what they're up against is the entire power of the federal government, right? Sort of trying to, to do certain things. And I, I do see places where they were able to push back a little bit. And, um, and I think that's an important story. And also, in terms of the contemporary Indian service, or what is now the, the um, Indian office, is I, ha I think I say 78% Native um, employees now. Uh, but someone was telling me that it's even, you know, he, I don't know, he was a former employee. He said it's like 96%. And I don't know if that's true. Um, but sort of, you know, that's so the where does that come from, right? And a lot of people will say the Indian Reorganization Act in the 30s. Um, but there's this whole generation that worked at the Indian service before that. And so for Native communities, this has been a, a strategy. It's been an important strategy. But this is also a generation um, of people who, and you know this from your own work, right? We talk about people like Carlos Montezuma or Charles Eastman or Gertrude Bonin in a lot of ways as if they are exceptional. And I don't think they are because here's this generation of people that were very similar um, and I wanted to tell their story. So for me, that's those. Both of those things are important. Right, indeed. And on that note, I'd <laughs> like to open things up to the audience, please. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Carl Sire. I'm associate editor at HM Indian. Ah. Um, I had a question. Uh, you mentioned Ann Stoller, yes. and some of your discussion reminded me of I think it was Ellinghus is taking assimilation yes. to, yeah. to heart, mm -hmm. and a white mother to a dark race. Yes. I forget the, that author. Uh, um, Margaret Jacobs. Margaret Jacobs. Yeah. How did those works, or, or did those works kind of inform yours, and how did you kind of uh, take from them, and, and maybe any disagreements you might have with some of theirs? A little bit. Yeah, Margaret Jacobs, um, every time, so when I first started, was proposing my dissertation, I went to a conference, and her first book was out, and the first chapter is on field matrons, and I thought, oh, she's done my project, but she, she hadn't. And then, you know, uh, White Mother to a Dark Race came out two years ago, right before my book, and I was like, ah, because I talked quite a bit about um, maternalism and how, you know, one of the ways white women are brought into this system is um, this idea that, again, that as women they are different, they have a particular role as mothers um, to play, and it, it actually allows women to enter a lot of positions in this moment in the late 19th century, and, and Margaret Jacobs does an excellent job of talking about their um, role in these child removal policies, and again, she I really, it was great. I was able to cite her, and she says a lot of really smart things that I could then build on. Um, 
you know, that this is a form of violence that is equally as um, traumatic as sort of military violence, even though people often talk about it as like, oh, it's the kinder, gentler federal government. Um, but what she really helped me think about was um, the way in which um, Native women were really pathologized as a justification for removing their children, that they couldn't be good mothers, um, and so their children had to be taken away and white women put in their place as surrogate mothers. Um, and so when these Native women start taking these positions, particularly as matron, which is this mother figure, um, administrators really struggle with that tension, that they're not, and they keep saying, well, they're, they're not as good as white women. They can't be good mothers. They can't be in this position, and they keep trying to transfer them to these menial labor positions of cooks and, and mat uh, laundresses, which are lower paying and harder and all these. And so it, it was another one of these moments where I saw this pattern, um, and her work really helped me realize that it was about the way they'd been pathologized, and so there's this tension with these positions that they're putting them in because they need labor, um, but then the ideology really is, um, and so they're often being demoted, and they have to really fight that. Um, and Catherine Ellinghouse's book, um, yeah, I, I, I think, so she, both of those books are comparative with Australia. And in Catherine Ellinghouse's, um, she really focuses on relationships between um, Native men and white women, particularly um, at Carlisle, and it's um, Native students and white teachers. And um, so it, it was very useful to think about, I, I see it, is beyond Carlisle. I see it again throughout the Indian service because Carlisle is not the only place that people are being brought together. Um, she also, in her comparatives to Australia, says that you know in the U.S. it was everything was well. I'm going to paraphrase and, and probably do her an injustice, but you know it's sort of hunky dory, right? These marriages could happen, and it wasn't really a big deal in Australia. It was very taboo, and it was a lot harder. And and I think she's right in the sense that there. There is this space in the United States for those marriages to occur, but they do, I see these couples, particularly when the men sort of are competing economically with white men. So when they get, to, many of them get promoted to supervisor because they fit this definition of assimilation. They're fairly well educated, they're often Christians, very involved in their churches. They marry white women, they have these sort of, right, and white women are sort of the, arbiters of civilization, so if they sort of choose these men, the implication is that they, they have reached this point. Um, but when they sort of get these positions that are well-paying, that white men want, that's when their marriages become this problem. And, and again, that's a pattern that, I don't have a huge sample, but in my sample of sort of six, it does become an issue, and that's when, so it's, it's not until they sort of begin to really challenge white male um, supremacy. So I, I think that, that Allen House is right, but I think that they do face some, some real problems that she doesn't, because she's comparing them to Australia, where it was worse. Um, so, but I build on both of them, and I think they're both very good, very useful. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, Billy Kaiser, PhD student. And uh, you talked about uh, how this began as a dissertation for you, and I'm just curious, what are some of the major substantive and methodological differences between the dissertation and the book, and how did you go about rethinking and reformulating those ideas for the book project? <laughs> well, one of the biggest ones was, was the sources um, and the addition of these personnel files of the Native women. So the, the, the dissertation really focuses much more on the white employees. Um, and by the end of the project, I was really not as interested in them and was much more interested in the Native employees and their relationships, again, sort of these intertribal relationships. Um, so it probably would have been, a, you know, depending on when you're thinking about it, it can be a very different project. But um, the other thing was really, I was thinking about the home as a category um, because this is what the policymakers were focused on. But I really sort of found Ann Stoller and these ideas of intimate colonialism um, as a much stronger sort of theoretical model for the book. So, um, so sort of the addition of those sources and then really this theoretical framework um, helped me think through that. And also, <laughs> chapter three of my dissertation is a total disaster. It was a sort of data dump, right? Um, I had all this information and I didn't quite know what to do with it. And so one of the biggest changes for the book was really how I arranged the information. 
Um, and I was juggling this <laughs> institutional history of sort of this administrative unit and the social history of the employees, and I had to figure out how to tell that story. And so I, it's turned into this tripart structure of sort of the institutional, this is why it was set up, the social history of this is who the employees were and this is how they changed it, and then sort of the coming back to the institutional and this, you know, this is what it looks like now. So I would say I added theory, I added sources, and then I really rearranged everything. Um, so it's very different. More questions? Yes, ma'am. I, I just have a comment because I found it interesting when you were talking about how the Indian mothers were pathologized. And it was just a very few months ago, I heard a little segment on NPR, and it was a Native American mother who was uh, being interviewed and saying that on the road Redbud Reservation, the white mothers or federal workers were coming and taking Indian children away from the mothers for no apparent reason and just saying, you're a bad mother. And she says, and then they did not put them in foster homes of Native American families. They put them in white families. And she says, and the Native American mothers wanted to foster these children, and uh, they wouldn't let them. And it sort of was an ongoing problem as far as she was concerned and this is these are current times yeah yeah so apparently it's not entirely dead yet no not at all it's absolutely I mean the the, the foster system and foster care system and adoption system and actually Margaret Jacobs is now working on this in the 20th century um, yeah remains um, you know there were in the 1970s really some efforts made about adoption um, to try to make sure that that Native families sort of had first choice for Native children because they were using adoption, again, sort of state systems and um, particularly state governments were using adoption and social sort of foster care to take children away, again, from Native families, sort of an ongoing problem. And, um, and yeah, it, it, there was sort of this moment when there was a lot of awareness and there were attempts to fix it, but I've heard the same thing, that it's, it's still a major um, problem and again a way of removing children from their cultures and a way of trying to um, get rid of tribal identity. So you're absolutely, it's a long legacy, the legacy is still there, it's still an issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Yes. At the beginning of your talk, you talked about how it's a long journey, but you'll get there to those of us who are yes. writing our dissertation. <laughs> and we often hear about how dissertations are this love-hate relationship where you just can't get out of the abusive relationship <laughs> with it, but you know, it's something that you've committed to. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I'm just curious uh, if there was a moment where you were just like looking at it and you're just hating it, <laughs> and then something happened and kept you going. <laughs> like, if you had any kind of those moments or... Um, I don't know if I ever hated it, but it was very hard to let go of it, actually, in my case, um, be, to, to sort of put it out there and let it go, because it, I sort of kept thinking I would solve sort of one, answer one question, and then have more questions that I wanted to answer. But um, I think what was very liberating was the realization that it, there's never a point when it's totally finished, right? With the dissertation, I got a job and it had to be done, right? And so that was like, okay, this is what it's going to be. Um, and even with the book, which I thought, you know, with the dissertation, I thought, well, I'll fix that in the book. Um, and I fixed a lot, but there had to be a point with the book as well that it needed to be done. Um, and sort of realizing, in part because thing, my thinking changed so much, realizing that it's okay to sort of have the project and finish it and even if what happens changes or my ideas change I can write another book or an article or you know and so um, sort of realizing that it would never be perfect but it would be as good as it could be was was nice and again the deadline was well you have to have tenure and your book has to be in so <laughs> this is what it will be um, and so I think there will be a moment particularly for the dissertation when you're like yeah this is fine this is I am done with this moment this part of the project and you'll, you'll realize that when you, <laughs> you sort of get I never hated it. <laughs> the writing I, I may have hated, but never the topic. Anything else? Oh, 
Yes, sir. Taking off on that very theme, uh, if you had the chance to keep writing, what would you change in the book? Or are you, what are you sorry that you left out? <laughs> are you going to be doing more? Are you planning to uh, continue it or do something completely different? I'm sort of doing both. Well, the first, I, I, seriously, there's this huge typo um, in the introduction. It kills me. The Indian office was not founded in 1834. It was 1824. That's the first thing I would change. Um, but uh, no, I mean, as I said, there, are, there were so many stories and these people that are so compelling, and I really couldn't tell these individual stories. I, I do some. I use some as examples. Um, so I, I'm actually, there are a couple people that I'm following and trying to they will at least be articles. Um, and one person, actually, Dr. Iverson, I'm glad you're here because I want to ask you about him. Uh, his name is Peter Paquette, and he's the superintendent um, at Fort Defiance on the Navajo Reservation. But he himself is um, uh, Winnebago and French uh, from uh, Wisconsin. And he wants, he sort of works in Wisconsin, um, but again, they're sort of uncomfortable with that. And eventually, he ends up as supervisor on Navajo. Um, at Fort Defiance, and he more or less brings his entire family down to work at Fort Defiance. So his sister comes down as matron, and enormous numbers of nieces and nephews come down in the Indian service. His brother comes down and works as a trader there, and so there's this whole community of, um, you know, again, sort of Métis people um, from Wisconsin in at Navajo, and he um, he adopts or is legal ward for some Navajo children and sort of I, I want to know about his relationship. Again, I, I became very interested in these intertribal relationships and Native people sort of learning about each other and thinking about what they had in common. So he's one. Um, there's another woman who's also, um, she's Turtle Mountain and uh, Chippewa and French, uh, Marie Baldwin, who works for the Indian office in Washington, D.C., and is one of the first Native women to get her law degree, and is involved in the Society of American Indians, is also a major um, feminist and involved in the suffrage movement. And I really want to sort of think about her and, and tell her story um, as well. But then I have an entirely different project that um, I'm really, it's very early, um, a very early stage. Um, one of the hats I wear as a teacher is as an environmental historian. And um, I've been very interested in Highway 101, which is the north-south highway on the west coast, um, which I thought was going to be sort of an environmental history. But um, I keep seeing Native people there. And it may end up being an Indians on the road sort of project because um, it goes through several reservations. Um, they're used symbolically in tourism, but they're also there. Um, there's a story of a kid who was sent from Hoopa Valley to the Riverside School um, boarding school, and he runs away, and basically he runs up 101, the entire, right, all of California. Um, in 1926, when they opened the Redwood Highway portion of, of Highway 101, they hold an Indian marathon to publicize it, and um, each town along the way sort of sponsors a runner, most of whom are from Northern California, but at least three guys from Zuni come out and compete, um, and I think I think the second year a Zuni guy wins. Um, so there are sort of these really interesting ways in which Native people are there. And, and really contemporary, sort of now, um, Native presence is becoming very clear on 101 with um, both kind of recognition, um, but also the casinos. Um, and there have been just interesting sort of moments. Um, the Pomo just sort of won this fight they'd been fighting to have a rock it was a sacred rock for them, but it had been called Squaw Rock um, under California's sort of historic landmarks or whatever for years and years and years. Um, and they just got the name changed um, to, I think it's Frog Woman Rock, but it's right, culturally significant for the Pomo. And I, I find, and that's right, right along the highway. It was one of the highway markers. Um, so there are these interesting ways in which those two things intersect that I want to play with. Um, so on one hand, I'm sort of continuing with this, and on the other hand, I'm I'm not really sure where I'm going. <laughs> Somewhere else, on another road. Yeah. Well, Dr. Cahill has been up since before the crack of dawn to be with us. So I'm going to uh, bring this conversation to a close. Thanks to the audience for their thank questions. You. And a big thank you to Dr. Cahill for being with us today.